So basically, atomic is more about cultural space. Like not just about the food, like all the ceramic is made by the Korean designer, and then even all our soy sauce and our soybean paste, like everything is made with like artisan maker in Korea. So I really want to bring their story yeah. into here. You're listening to the Taste Podcast. I'm editor in chief Matt Rodbard here with senior editor Anna Hizol. Today on the show, we have Elia and Jungyun Park, the owners of the progressive Korean restaurants Auto Boy and Auto Mix in New York City. Also, later on the show, we have Chef Dan Holtzman answering one of Matt's burning food questions. But Matt, what was it like catching up with Elia and JP? And what, how is the opening for Auto Mix going so far? Auto Mix is definitely the most exciting restaurant in New York of the year. It's being well reviewed. Uh, it's a 12-person tasting counter focusing on modern Korean dishes based around the fundamentals of Korean cooking like hue, Korean sashimi, jim, braising, and ghee, the grill. I love it. I can't wait to go. And it's not that common in New York City to see a Korean tasting menu. Is that right? It isn't. There's Jungshik, of course, which has been there for years and really it's historical and great. But I, I think this restaurant... Um, it's just so cool to see Korean f- uh, food cooked in this way, plated in this way, served with beautiful wines. I just think it's it's just that next step in Korean cooking that gets me really excited. Here's Matt talking to Elia and Jungyun. Elia and JP, welcome to the Taste Podcast. Uh, thanks for having us. Yeah, thank, thank you for having us. Yeah, I've been such a fan of your both of your work since you opened <laughs> Autoboy a few years ago. But also, not just the food, but as people. I really respect the way you operate um, your business. And I've heard from folks who you, work for you, you, you are operators um, at the fullest level. Like, <laughs> you really are there all the time and you fostering um, uh, a really great environment inside your, your you restaurant. Thank you so much. Tell me, how did you come together with the idea of Auto Boy opening your first restaurant? Uh, I mean, we are thinking about opening the restaurant in New York like long times. Even when we moved to like New York about like six years ago, and then we planned to open the restaurant. But the first time it was about in Korea. But when I like living in the New York and then working at the restaurant called Jungsik in Tribeca. It seems like the Korean food is like getting more exciting and then people really want to know about the Korean flavor and the, about the like knowledge about the Korean food. So it seems like the New York also a really good market if you open the restaurant in the New York. So me and Elia have been talking about like how we can approach the, you know, to New Yorker about our like, you know, restaurant. So we try to like developing the idea what kind of restaurant would be really fit with it. So Autoboy Ideas it comes out maybe I can say like about three, four years ago. And then we like talking almost like every day about what can we do, how we can building and then what kind of things we can do well. So like yeah, it's been taking about that year but it's really you know, people really enjoyed it and people like still a lot of the support to us, that means great. Your timing I thought was just really good. Um because you opened um, not in on 32nd Street in, in the heart of Koreatown, but on 28th Street. So you're a little bit detached from being kind of grouped into the, the a K-Town barbecue restaurant. Then, of course, with the timing, there's a lot being written about Koreatown and Korean food in America. I wrote my book in 2016, early 2016s, we published it. And we saw a great a bunch of, in, you know, interest in Korean cuisine. So I agree with you. But then you just... You operated a restaurant that really broke a lot of rules. You were, I, I mean, calling it a banjan restaurant. <laughs> I thought brilliant because you were doing small plates. It wasn't communal dining per se with the large soups and stews and jungals and psalms, but it was more so um, plate by plate. Mm-hmm. Uh, tell me, Elia, was that uh, an intentional choice going as the banchan restaurant and going out of K Town to open? Because uh, as a Korean person, we grew up with banchan. We at home because we can like make a jungle every single time, every every meal. So usually we enjoy the meal for the breakfast, lunch, mostly about the the rice and the main banchan together. And this idea from because when you go to the Korean restaurant in K Town or other 
the Korean restaurant, you get lots of side dish called banchan. But the banchan is always complimentary, like always free. So people think about this is a free food. But when the chef make a banchan small dishes, it take a lot of effort and take a lot of time to make it. So you want to like give. A uh, little bit of elevate the style of panchan, and people can focus not only about the big jungle or not only about big garbage. And we want to like highlight about small panchan together, so they can choose their own panchan, street panchan, and they can make their own like table mm-hmm. for this idea from. And really, you guys from the start were a huge success. Thank you, you get great <laughs> reviews, and I, I think it was because of the dining and and you know there were some people confused like this is you're paying for banchan, but it, it really isn't traditional banchan. There are there are small plates. What's one of the dishes that really sets you apart um, at Auto Boy? Uh, I think definitely most of them is not traditional banchan because yeah. they're like banchan. Usually people thought it's going to be like like namul. Or seasoned some, vegetables, yeah, seasoned vegetable, yeah, seasoned vegetable, or some like any kind of dried fish, or you know something like can keep in the refrigerator like long times. So, you know, one has like long shelf life. But our banchan is like more kind of fresh made, and then it has like more like different texture in the one plate. So I mean, like more can be well like designed at one dish themselves. You know, mm-hmm. so but. Actually, most of the flavor is comes from traditional way. We braising the like lotus root into the, like soy dashi, and then we making like tofu mixture with like seaweed, like that kind of thing is very like traditional. But like we try to using like little like tweaks with because you know the New Yorker they're like been a lot of the experience about the Mexican cuisine and like a lot of different culture, and I also learn from there a lot. So I want to like using that kind of cultural stuff as well, like little bit of the like Middle Eastern spice on the top yeah. or something like, you know. I think it's making more the Ato Boy is more like kind of special space, you know. Oh, it absolutely is. And let's talk about your time at Junshik. You were there for quite a while, and explain what you were doing there. You were the CDC, is that right? Yeah, I, I I used to working at the Junshik about five years. Okay. So basically, I think two years in Junshik in Seoul. And then three years, Jung Shik in New York. Oh, I've been there. I've been to the yeah, one. Yeah, so. cool, nice. Yeah. So when you're in New York and you're in Tribeca at the old Chanterelle space, yes. really historical mm-hmm. space, um, were people were people embracing the the cuisine? Because I feel Jung Shik sometimes is misunderstood slightly. Mm. That maybe the dishes are a little more French than Korean. Uh, I think the Jung Shik is he's the first guy who made it some kind of new Korean trend. He started from the like 2006 or seven. That means like more than 10 years ago. And, but also basically he wanted taking some like kind of traditional like fine dining format, you know, start with like cold appetizer mm-hmm. and, you know, hot appetizer and like, fish or like main course and preserved and dessert and that kind of format and serving the, you know, nice wine and, the waiter need to be like wear a night a suit, you know. It's like more kind of formal, like fine dining feel. So, like when people go there, I feel like oh, this is like regular fine dining, you know, traditional fine, traditional dining. fine dining, like kind of feel. But the food wise, also he like they're like try to using a lot of the Korean like the mm-hmm. flavor, but at the same time they're also using a lot of the like kind of stock or some butter or sort of yeah, know, it yeah. felt like EMP yeah. 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 or even Bo- Cafe Bolu mm. even some of those dishes. Yeah, yeah, so I mean it's because I think because of like first like kind of concept, so he want to pretty hard to going to aggressive way to like Korean flavor using it. So he's like kind of in between. But anyway, because of like after Jungshik success, like yeah. many Korean chefs, oh wow, this is really cool, you know. I want to try this one. So the mingles like happen again. It mingles no. in, in, Seoul, in Seoul, yeah, which is Seoul. a restaurant that I've been to, and you've worked there, or you no, a good friend of mine, good friends, mm. uh, Mingu Kang. Mm. I think that restaurant is really progressive in, yeah. on the world stage. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, and I think you're you're bringing up an important point, and I'm so glad you did. The Jungshik is a pioneer. To, yeah, in in 07, when they opened, there could be no auto boy in this in, in, yeah, interest in Korean cooking if there wasn't a Jungshik. Mm, definitely, yeah. Because after him, it's like Korea, like young chef. It's, oh, I really want to learn about Korean cuisine. I really want to 
listen about what the Korean food is, you know. Before then, like many like young talented or passionate like cook, they always want to learning about French food or mm-hmm. Italian food. Or you know, like EMP, or they always like reading that kind of book, cookbook, that instead of like traditional Korean flavor. But now I think a lot of like young cook, they really want to learn about what's the traditional, what's the like flavor we like grew up with. You know, that's like the really cool thing. They're looking up to you. I mean, (laughs) both of you are, are, but you, the chef JP, they're looking up to you. You know, the review in New York Magazine for your new restaurant, uh, Auto Mix, we'll talk about that, was tremendous. (laughs) Thank you so much. Um, So I think that's really cool that you Mm -hmm. have been, you've seen it through all the way. Mm -hmm. Uh, Elia, tell me about the space at Auto Boy. I love it. It's one of my favorite parts. Just, it's like, it's like brutalist. It's like hard concrete. It feels, was, is that a style that you find, uh, is it very Korean uh, Mm -hmm. in terms of design? Because Auto Boy, cuisine wise too, Auto Boy is not like a traditional Korean restaurant. We are like more New York style Korean restaurant. We are trying to use New York ingredients plus Korean techniques. So same like a space too. It's not like not. It doesn't look like the traditional Korean restaurant. It looks like mm, some maybe some wine bar or can be cafe. We did just whatever we liked. Mm-hmm. We liked the very simple. We like industrial design. So like a more more fun fun space. So we try to like keep more fun and cool space. That's why we put like gray, navy and the concrete style. And all the concrete and mm-hmm. I think it's it felt to me it felt like Seoul having Korean uh, food in that uh, in that environment mm-hmm. very modern. Mm-hmm. Modern is a hard word to say, but in a in a way in a contemporary yeah. setting. And um, unlike going to 32nd Street where it's like home style and <laughs> yeah. you've got the burners mm-hmm. and the barbecue op- apparatus everywhere. Yeah. yeah, I thought that was really cool. But then fast forward, you've opened Auto Mix, which mm-hmm. is completely different, exciting in different ways. Thank you. <laughs> you, me, um, you really wanted to bring the seatings down. You're doing – tell me a little bit about the restaurant. It's a tasting menu restaurant. Yeah, actually – me and Elia have been thinking about the Atto Mix first than the Atto Boy. Because uh, my like, culinary background is usually about the fine dining. Yeah, Jung Sik. Yeah, yeah. Jung Sik. And before that, I used to work at the uh, Cutler and Co. in Melbourne. Mm-hmm. That also like fine dining. Cutler Co. Cool. I've yeah. been there. I've been there. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. Nice. Yeah. And nice. I, I started with the uh, Redbury in London. Oh. So, like, you know, most of the place I used to work in is like kind of fine dining. So I thought, you know, my first like, restaurant need to be fine dining. But we changed the mind because, like, you know, we are very new in the New York dining scene. Like, if you start with the fine dining, people, it's, I mean, it's, like, pretty, like, risky start, you know. If you start with it, like, people doesn't know about who you are and then what kind of food are, are you doing. You're asking $175 yeah. a person and they don't and, know who yeah, you are. Know, yeah, so, so we... Uh, so we're changing the mind and then we might be need to be start with it, like more like you know more accessible style yeah. Yeah. more so casual this, yeah this is like Atto Boy start with it and then after two years like you've been talking about Korean like food is like getting bigger and you know huge success now like even the OEG and Atto Boy and Code like everywhere is like they got some really nice review and people love it a lot so I feel and her like, name is Han. Yeah, her name yeah. is Han as well. Shout that out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I feel like, oh, it's like time to doing something more, like can be more focused about it and more can deep. be more detailed about it, like more knowledgeable space. So that's like, oh, it seems like it's timing for the Atomics. So we try to build in some atomic style. So basically Atomics is more about cultural space, like not just about the food, like all the ceramic is made by the Korean designer and our like uniform was made with like Korean designer, and then we got some lot of like fresh ingredient, also like dried ingredient from the Korea directly, and then even all our soy sauce and our soybean paste, like everything is made with like really artisan maker in Korea. So, I mean, I've been pr- preparing this one like long time, but at the same time, I meet really a lot of the like passionate, really cool people in Korea. So I really want to bring their story into yeah. here so that's the reason we like start writing down our menu card i, I want to talk to ellie yeah. about the menu cards because i think that's a really cool part of the experience mm-hmm. at auto mix is each course is presented with a single card which has a beautiful illustration on the on the front mm-hmm. each card has either has hui or mm-hmm. jim or some different categories which 
was this in an attempt to educate as well as entertain? I think JP mentioned that. Tell me about that a little bit. Yeah, because we love fine dining restaurant, but it's really hard to memorize everything. Sure. And yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Especially after some picture, drink, you know. <laughs> yeah, really with a couple of drinks, you don't know where the courses are. You're so right. And especially the Korean fine dining is very new for everyone. So we want to share our information. And also we want to educate a little more about the Korean cuisine too. That's why we made the menu card. And there's all the information about our ceramics and how JP make the dish. And how, especially like hui, because people know what the sashimi is, what the sushi is. But it's not hui or jim is not popular to everyone. Hui, yeah, to be clear, is, uh, is the raw, raw fish. fish in Korea, yeah. but it's very different. It's, mm-hmm. co- it's killed right away. Mm-hmm. So that's why we... We want to make a little more educational space for the atomics and for our guests too. So that's why we made a menu card too. And second thing is JP's idea because chef is artist. But if you hang your art, you can keep your art forever. If you if you have a music, you can list always whenever you want. But food wise, if you eat something, it disappear. So we want to keep our memory too as an art. That's why we made a menu card. So if I see like our first menu card, oh, that was 2018, our first menu. So kind of art memory-wise, too. And you're switching the menu every quarter or every season? Uh, basically, we try to change in like maybe four or five times per year. Yeah. So like pretty hard to say it's like changing by seasonal because like depend on like how we prepare and then how like you know so yeah because as you can see the korean ingredients we fermented a lot so sometimes we pick up the summer ingredients and ferment it and using for the winter season too so it's really hard to say we change the menu seasonally but we try to change like quarterly yeah you're being honest about the way the calendar works i appreciate that because it's really easy to say quarterly but or Mm -hmm. seasonally sorry but the seasons are so Mm -hmm. different Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But seafood, let's talk about seafood. It's yeah. so fundamental in Korean cooking. Yeah. Are you buying seafood from Korea? What are some what are some uh, products that you're bringing in? Uh like seafood, like fresh one is really hard to get in from there. Uh so most of like fresh seafood is comes from Japan and like the dry seafood, like the dried anchovy and that, uh, that and then some lot of the our like seaweed is comes from Korea. Mm. So some of them we directly got from there and then some of them we got from the H Mart in New Jersey. So Yeah, I mean <laughs> H Mart gets the best stuff from yeah. Korea for sure. You, you gotta I mean you're mm. you're a fine dining establishment but you gotta shout out H Mart. Yeah H Mart is like best. you know best. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. uh, respect to H Mart. Mm. Um I like I like to when I talk about Korean food in general, I like to talk about thinking outside of barbecue mm-hmm. because obviously Americans perceive Korean food to be barbecue, barbecue. or grilled barbecue. Mm-hmm. It's not really mm-hmm. actually barbecue anymore. <laughs> <grilled. laughs> call it barbecue yeah. to m- add to even more confusion. Mm-hmm. But seafood is so fundamental in mm-hmm. Korean cooking. Mm-hmm. What are, I wanted to hear maybe from Elia some other elements of uh, Korean cuisine that maybe Americans don't quite understand quite yet. Or JP, either of you, if you wanted to jump in. I think the dried food, like dried ingredient... So in Korea, we like using a lot of the dried ingredients, like dried squid and dried vegetable. And like, you know, we using a lot of the stock also made with dried, like mm. the pyogo mushroom and like, you know, but dried food is like, it doesn't look like fresh, you know, so people thought it's going to be, oh, it's not really fresh. But actually, even in China food as well, it's like if you dry some seafood, it's like changing the structure and just change the flavor. So sometimes if you're using the dry the muscle, it's like better than fresh. Adds intensity yeah, to yeah, the flavor. Yeah, 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 better than like fresh muscle juice. Yeah. So like that kind of product is also well known in Korea, but people are not quite understanding yet, you know. So so we we using a lot of dry food as well in, in Atomix too. We, for example, like, you know, like really good, the cucumber is only came about like only available about one month, like end of maybe June to like like uh, like August, about two months. But we crop like a lot of the like cucumber and then we dried it, and then we cucumber is mostly water, so what is, what <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's a dr- shrink a lot. It's it's shrink shrink a lot. Like, yeah. yeah, but we like dehydrate in the salted water, yeah, and then we make the salad with it. It has really like Crunch. still has like really beautiful aroma. And the really crunch texture, so 
you know, that's what we are I doing it. That. Yeah. Anything else that you want, Elia, about Korean cuisine that maybe Americans should know a little bit more about? Putting you on the spot a little bit. Mm, for example, uh, I want to talk about our like, sauce too, because especially in America, there's only like one soy sauce and using for all the cuisine. But in Korea, we have many different of soy sauce and one specially one soy sauce for only for the soup and the other soy sauce only for the seasoning. So maybe we want to spread the word about that kind of different soy sauce in our restaurant too. So we're using the special soy sauce from Korea. Name is Kisundo. And there's the three different soy sauce, Cheongjang, Jungjang, and Jingjang. Depends on the AG. So chef using the, all the different soy sauce and different technique for the all different the dishes. Yeah, ganjan is something that I just, I don't know much about. I've seen it mm-hmm. made, but it is fundamental to understand mm-hmm. Korean cuisine. Mm-hmm. The different, really the four important. soup yeah. versus yeah. the four dipping. Mm-hmm. Um, where am I buying these? Can I buy these at H Mart, these different styles? Or is it probably, <laughs> uh, for think, the home cook? I think not yet, but I'm sure because they're like in Korea, so the market for the ganjang is like changing a lot now. It's, it used to be like like the you know, ganjang is like only made by like big company, but now it's like a lot of the artisan maker. They yeah. start making their own way. So even a lot of like ganjang is you know called ganjang, but it's like kind of quite different flavor. It depends on what kind of like soybean they are using and how to like growing the bacteria with it. So I mean, it's going to be like bigger and bigger in Korea as well. So I think that it's going to be like jumping up to the like. I market love it. in US as well soon. So it's like olive oil was twenty years ago. Yeah, yeah it, it was all pretty much commodity, mm-hmm. and, and then you, of course, ed- with education, they were yeah. smaller oh. producers, so like from Sicilia and well, from where, like you know, yeah. by the like region and who's the producing with, you know, it's yeah. like you know, change the quality. They're mm-hmm. quite start understanding, and now I think the about the ganjang also like start, you know. Let's talk about Seoul. You you travel back often, and I just want like educate us and the listeners about what Seoul is like these days. I mean, it had its moment um, with the Olympics um, mm-hmm. last or earlier this year, yeah. but I mean, dining in Seoul is so fun and yeah. exciting. so exciting. Yeah, exciting. exciting. Mm-hmm. What's going on there? Uh, I mean, like New York uh, compared to New York seems like small, but actually they're like activating a lot, you know. So a lot of the young cook who's trained by the like a lot of the like good chef, they're moving back to Korea, and then they're try to find out their own way how to developing the Korean food, and then maybe how to make the like fusion like Korean like French food like you know so they're like doing little bit of really like interesting stuff a lot. So it's compared to like five years now ago like now like there's a lot of the really good quality restaurant is you know in Korea and also Michelin right actually start like you know in Korea ago. about three years ago yeah that was a big moment so yeah mm-hmm. it's like kind of more big moment especially you know I think one thing is about the language barrier so mm-hmm. like for traveler it's really hard to find out where I should eat in Seoul but now it's a lot of the article is like available in like you know you can googling yeah, well, neighbor. I, yeah. I find Google neighbor. versus neighbor is <laughs> yeah, challenging because yeah. Google isn't as effective in Seoul as it is in like Tokyo. Nah, not really. Yeah. Unfortunately, mm. but how about just for our listeners? Are there any restaurants that we should be looking at for our future travels to Seoul? Because I know we all will be going to Seoul in the next few mm. years. So I think for fine dining, we already mentioned about the mingles. Mingles, mingles <laughs> sure. is like always like top my suggestion to, and also there's a restaurant called Konsuksu. It's dead also like fine dining, but what he's doing at the Korea is like he also like try to find a really good quality ingredient in Korea and then he working with a lot of the artisan maker about the like soy sauce and doenjang, a lot of things. Similar to what you're yeah, doing. Yeah, so <laughs> I'm definitely believe like his food is like really spot on. And also for more like casual place, I think that I like the picnic. Oh, oh. yeah! It's a new place. It's run by the uh, my friend Chung Hoo, and he's uh, basically trained by the in France, but he also like start doing a lot of the growing the vegetable by himself, yeah. and then they are doing really like fun stuff as well. So if you like, if someone like the natural wine and like really good bite, 
I totally recommend. Totally the picnic. sounds like most American restaurants. Yeah, yeah. Small plates and natural wines. It's yes. a beautiful so, idea. Yeah, yeah. So beautiful. I've not been to Picnic, but I've read about it. Mm. Uh, I want to close, Elliot. I'm going to put you on the spot. Like, what's the next project? What is the next concept? I would. I know you just opened Auto Mix. Mm. But, of course, you're thinking ahead, and we could use so many different... <laughs> we could use more Korean restaurants. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I love them so much. Well, we don't have any exact plan yet. We, now we try to focus more on Atomics. It's our second baby until settle down a little bit more. But we have a lot of things to do. We want to maybe open more Korean restaurants here, or we want to try more restaurants in other countries, too. Mm. But so far... Unfortunately, we want to focus on our first, second baby, Auto Boy, Auto Mix, a little more. Of course. Um, I could see Auto Boy doing well in Paris. I'm just going to say that. I'm just <laughs> yeah. going to say that yeah. on the record. Mm-hmm. But sorry to put you on the spot. I know you just <laughs> opened, and it takes so much to open a restaurant. So we'll we'll be okay with having two. I hope. <laughs> yeah. Paris would be great. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining the Taste Podcast. It was such a pleasure. Thank, thank you. you so thank much. you, man. Thanks, Thanks for really having fun. us. Thank you. Here's chef Dan Holtzman answering one of Matt's burning food questions. Dan Holtzman, I got a question for you. What is XO sauce? It's such a great question. XO sauce is this like magical, uh, intensely flavorful, MSG rich sauce that originated in Hong Kong. I guess it's like a Cantonese thing. Um, And the name XO sauce comes off of, I guess, a bottle of cognac because it's like extra old. And, you know, folks in, in Hong Kong are into into um, uh, drinking expensive cognac. And so they, they figured XO sounds like it's expensive. And so they just use the name to mean like this is excellent. So what are you uh, putting um, XO sauce in exactly? XO sauce is basically made of seafood, ginger, garlic, a couple of other ingredients that you fry in oil. And the oil gets flavored. And then basically by frying all these ingredients together, they all kind of grind together and disintegrate into this mushy, intensely flavored um, sauce that you can cook with. It's if you, you know, just on a bowl of rice, you can have some on vegetables as a seasoning and on fish. It's, it's a great seasoning. It's basically like a, like an all purpose seasoning sauce. And I love how a lot of recipes call for dried scallops. Dried scallops. So I was just recently in Macau and a lot of dried scallops come from, uh, come from there they are extremely expensive. And so that's one thing you want to look for. It, cheap XO sauce does not exist. It's not good XO sauce. You need to spend the money because it's it's made with dried scallops and dried scallops are very expensive. The larger the dried scallops, the more expensive, just like the fresh ones. And like so many ingredients that we kind of put our, we'll throw our nose up to in America, dried ingredients can be even better quality than fresh ingredients depending on how they're dried. So true. Dan Holzman, thank you so much. The Taste Podcast is hosted by Matt Rodbard and me, Anna Hiesel. The show is produced by Gabrielle Lewis, studio recordings by Pat Stango, theme music by Steve Rydell. Interviews are recorded live at Books Are Magic in Cobble Hill, Brooklyn, and at Penguin Random House Studios in Manhattan. Visit Taste online at tastecooking.com. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.